Hey, it's that Brass Facts guy here again. Recently I've discussed a lot about civilian recon during semi or complete societal collapse. So I want to expand upon that today, the concept of civilian recon, and why it's not just an excuse to go in the woods and is instead a potential tool in your tool set, something that you want to actively train and prepare for. Is it LARP? Yeah, yeah. But you likely own several rifles, tactical gear, preps, probably even night vision thermals. So chances are the only time when you could actually use all of this stuff for real is that aforementioned societal collapse, at which point it does make sense to prepare for something like this. Commit that last percentage point. It's fun, and hey, if we keep this up as a society, this stuff will actually be incredibly useful. We'll see. So we're game planning out what we might think could happen, so we're more mentally prepared when something does happen, or if it happens. Note, as per usual, I'm a complete buffoon. This is not legal advice. Blah, 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 blah. View these videos as something to get your brain juices going. Think about the idea of civilian reconnoitering, not as a policy prescription of, hey, idiots, this is how you do it or you'll die. For starters, near ongoing or complete collapse is sort of a baseline for allowing much of this and the premise to occur. So to understand the benefits of why leaving your comfortable home stuffed full of canned food, lentils, MREs, let's view the complete static scenario. No recon. You never leave the green zone, if you will. The area, immediately defendable from the threshold of your house, but also slightly beyond. This is a very static, inflexible in nature because your first and last line of defense is basically your homestead. This isn't all bad. You need far less people. You are closer to those you seek to defend. Your loved ones, those you cannot go without. Your dog or cat, probably. Yeah, it, mm, sorry, a little danger close right there. For a lot of scenarios, this is it. This is what the doctor ordered. Hunker the fuck down and have a metaphorical pint and wait for it to all blow over. You have food, water, supplies, and amenities. Right? You have those, right? The percentage of people who don't have this luxury will be numerous, and they will be fighting over that, basically. And they are the vast majority. You will be a rounding error. During this phase of beginning and full-blown collapse, organized groups are going to be vastly outnumbered by smaller, unorganized groups or even lone wolf-type individuals, early on by simple statistics. Even in small urban areas that have buildups of only like a million, it is very unlikely that every single one of them will band together instantly and form a society. There will be fighting for scraps, and it doesn't matter how well prepared you are at fighting, doing El Presidente drills, uh, you're gonna get wrecked. Let's continue spinning that hypothetical dial, which feels a lot less hypothetical by the day, and we enter full-blown collapse, complete loss of infrastructure, you get Mad Max, Fallout, End of Times, so blah, 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 blah. After a certain period, the ratio of lone actors to organized groups will begin to tilt away from the chaos towards a new, different type of chaos reality. Survival of the fittest has set in. Who knows how long this will take? Some parts of the world, like Bosnia, took a couple weeks. For others, in other failed states, took significantly longer. The mechanism of failure really defines this. Actually, time for some quick whiplash. Night vision is pretty damn good for civilian recon. It adds an extra level of security to your plans, whether you're gonna do the aforementioned recon mission, planting potatoes at four in the morning, or whatever task you can dream of. Night vision is a force multiplier. Nightline is one such place where you can buy night vision and the sponsor of this video. And with my 15% discount code, just mentioned Aswax sent you, you will have a very competitive place to shop for black magic tubes to see in the dark. If you buy a PVS-14, you actually get, for a competitive price, very competitive actually, a new PVS-14 housing as part of the deal. This housing is lighter, offers digital buttons, and the ability to use both standard AA batteries and CR-123s, which not only pushes your battery life up to about 75 hours, it also means you don't actually need to carry AA's as a backup for your night vision system because, funnily enough, the CR-123 is the more ubiquitous tactical gear battery and you generally have more of those on you anyways if you're interested next time you go shopping for night vision considering opening up a tab at nightline and uh checking them out don't honk at me oh cocksucker so society has collapsed we've gone through a phase of turmoil and survival of the fittest we are now in a hypothetical regime where the fittest smartest most well prepared and obviously the most lucky still remain so while you are the main character in your own story, it is entirely unreasonable to assume you have a major advantage now over anyone that remains. They have proven themselves, and the assumption that you're just going to win any fight straight up because you're the G is unlikely. 
Now, I'd like to hope that most of these groups that remain just want to leave each other alone, avoid conflict, and in fact, if I had to guess, for most of them that is probably true, where eventually these groups actually do come together and we see the forming of larger societies, capable mini-societies, whatever things that humans tend to be hardwired to do. But even so, this will not occur instantly, and there's going to be a large percentage of those that have no desire to deal with the risk dynamic of sharing. Those have turned, we will have a non-insignificant portion of people that only got by, and now only know, raiding, scavenging, and violence. I'm going to call them the raider, because it's a heavy, popularized, uh, video game-esque term, but it gets the idea across. You can call it whatever you want. We know this to be mostly true because both of historical context, of previous soft local shit hit the fans, and more simply, just go onto any YouTube or Instagram comment section, or Discord even, and you'll find a lot of people that admit in droves to having tactical gear and all this stuff, but minimal food, preps, uh, ammo, you name it, and scavenging this stuff is part of their survival strategy. Which means they have probably a month of food and water tops. So whether these people realize it or not, they are the perfect breeding ground for those that will eventually seek to inflict violence on others because they have no choice. When you're out of food or water, you get desperate. You will not become a moral beacon, at least most will not. And you will do despicable things to keep yourself and your loved ones going for another day or two. How many times have you heard someone bragging about going around and taking from all the preppers that they call loot drops with their bubbled Mosin Nagat? And, these pe and some of these people actually have pretty good tactical knowledge, potentially very capable, a shitload of guns and gear, and the desire to take. Now, as an aside, the success rate of relying on people as loot drops is not a good plan and most will fail, but you don't need all of them to make it to present a credible threat. So even if 90% of them completely fall on their face day one, there are that 10% that remain that will be a very potent threat. Going up against these guys in straight up gunfights is a great way to eventually be attritioned. Okay, so we've gone through the potential threat. What's the plan here? So we could hunker down, as I mentioned, uh, and this served us well up to this point and kind of kept us out of the fray, but now we have to contend with the fact that the playing field is a lot of people like us, but a very good chunk of them will be that aforementioned raider, if you will. A smart, experienced person, but now likely with a group with zero compunction for murder to take what he needs. And your house, your stronghold, will eventually be found. And as resources dwindle and searching narrows in, that is going to be the predominant place for these groups to go. The jackpot, if you will. From their perspective, the risk is worth it. It's a catch of a lifetime that will set them straight for six months plus. For you, it's just another defense with zero upside. Losing one to two men is catastrophic for you, for most groups, in fact. For them, two to five men might be business as usual. And they're going to eventually kick down your front door, beat your ass in CQB, because CQB against mass forces is virtually unwinnable. And even if you have increased fortification, firewatch, rotating armed men, the reality still exists. Viewing the house like a castle in most scenarios is a terrible idea. It's cheaply built wooden and plaster structure that is only marginally better than concealment. And once you are found, the attacker is inherently favored once they realize what they're up against. Now, I'm not saying you're checkmated here. Not at all. This is part of the dilemma and dynamic of preparedness. There are things you can do to break out of this, many of which involve essentially abandoning your home or other uh, things you can do that eventually are probably going to be quite costly. But the point fundamentally is, and what I'm trying to get at here, against an organized group, I think the general notion of making your first and final stand at your doorstep is not going to be a good idea for long-term survival prep. Now, we can extend the perimeter, we can have kill boxes, increase fire watch, and more, and that's probably what most people are going to have to do, basically move the engagement zone away from the house. At some point, I will discuss perimeter defense as such, uh, maybe bring someone with more experience on in the matter. To be sure, you need perimeter defense. And there's a lot of things you can do to mitigate the downside, manpower issues, and more. But I think there's a relatively lower investment strategy to help augment this without just putting more people, more men on the metaphorical wall. Okay, so the heart of the video, reconnaissance. To me, it's a risk. But like with all risks, the goal is to pay a risk now with greater payout in the future. 
With a pretty low manpower investment, you can conform deploy a small group, as few as two people, in a more flexible, reconnaissance-style manner, without the expectation of intentionally getting in the gunfight as, say, a checkpoint kind of would be. Though, and absolutely in a pinch, you could have a recon unit very much get into a fight, sometimes intentionally as a stalling action, and sometimes you're just forced into it just due to fuck-ups, essentially. Anyways, this unit has a wide range of objectives available to it, though fundamentally the goal is quite simple. It's to feed information back to the overall community, team, or even just small group of like-minded prepared individuals. The fundamentals are simple, to be aware of threats and developments in your AO before you're staring them straight up in the face. This can take many forms. Mountains overlooking a city, a pass that leads into a community, a structure near a heavily trafficked crossroad, or even something as simple as buildings at a busy city block or something. For a very rural community in the desolate wasteland known as Western United States, yeah, I had to drive through Idaho recently, what the fuck, you can accomplish a lot with one or two positions, especially in mountainous terrains that funnels movements uh, in specific areas. However, as you shrink down the scale, especially as you move closer to rural or even full-blown cities, the effectiveness of any one reconnaissance OP will diminish drastically. Though you can of course mitigate this with elevated positions, high-rises, drone usage, and just going to more positions in a given time period. Just realize most people have a similar idea, and every time you do this, go to a new position, you are increasing the risk factor. Sometimes getting in these positions is doable in a single movement at night, Right? That's why we tried to be lightweight, but sometimes it will require a lot more gear if you plan to stay for there for quite some time. Maybe you'll have to stage some equipment, and sometimes it will require progressive leapfrogging with a QRF on tap ready to get you out safely if the zone is really hot. Regardless, the goal is simple. None of us have real ISR, and a drone, unfortunately, is not an adequate substitute for wide area surveillance. The loiter time is just simply way too low in practice for a environment that's actually fairly slow moving. Drones might actually be a pretty cool video yeah, for, for another time. Regardless, all the fundamentals of recon still apply. Low signature, lightweight weapons, lighter loadouts, night vision helps a lot for infill exfil, route planning, well-practiced break from contact, and a ongoing situational awareness map to kind of have a good idea of what is going on. It kind of builds upon itself. What are we getting out of something like this? Well, no shit, information. You get a rough idea, especially in an urban area, for example, of what the playing field is. Is that group over there on whatever and whatever street simply just big chilling in that home? Or are they sending out patrols? Where are those patrols roughly going? What is the disposition of these patrols? Are they looking for a fight or are they basically homeless status? That group over there keeps coming home with bags of what looks like loot, so to speak. Was it from a fight or is it just scavenging from houses? You can tell a lot due to facial and dispositions of the individuals. How healthy and nourished are they looking? Or are they one step away from looking like a zombie? Which one looks to be their leader? That group over there might obviously be conducting offensive operations and expanding from a, you know, a circular pattern out from their base. That group has night vision. That group over there is clearly using communication devices. Maybe we can hone in on that. The list goes on. We can begin to categorize the local area of operations, determine potential allies, potential threats, and everything in between. Sometimes you can even prevent just a spark point. If a mostly friendly group is patrolling in the area, you may notice them encroaching onto your position and you know to you know approach that differently were you to approach this group blindly without knowing their rough intentions, right? This type of recon is also the start of basis of mutual teamwork. The ability to confidently approach someone with the aim of working together because you know how they act and know that they're good people helps a lot in your longevity versus flipping a coin saying, hey, do you want to be buds and then getting shot in the face? Similarly, and perhaps obviously the most spicy and useful, you may discover the obvious raiding party that is prepping to do raiding things. And you may decide to meet them on one of their patrols in an ambush type scenarios, or if you're feeling especially froggy at the current operational base, fighting them on your terms. None of this can be facilitated if you are sitting in a static defensive perimeter around your home and just playing pure defense. For a community style, a larger community in a rural or non-built up area, you can use forward recompositions to keep eyes on another community. Not necessarily even a hostile one, but trust but verify. Observe their patterns. What are the de defenses like? their success, their failings, are they hunting? If that community gets attacked, view how they get attacked and what their response and capabilities. 
Sometimes you might even just be there to see if they need help. But obviously in the worst case scenario, if they potentially are a rival or neutral group to you, you may notice them potentially staging for an attack. This allows the recon party to report back to the base and even potentially in a dire situation, use this as a stalling force. Two people can hold up a lot of people if they know what they're doing. The obvious passive observation for a rural community could be something as simple as rotating a team in a couple of the mountain passes to warn the community at large that, hey, you know, people are crossing through and out of this mountain pass. It lets you have a rough idea of who is leaving and entering the area. Once again, not the hostile aspect, but hey, those guys look like they could use some help and we could use more people in our community. Or hey, heads up, there's a large group of travelers coming through the area. Try not to panic and shoot them on the spot by accident, right? Obviously, the flip side is the critical aspect. Oh man, there is a large offensive looking group of men pushing through the area in a very tactical fashion. We should keep an eye on them or maybe even maneuver onto them and tell them to leave. All of these things are not something you want to meet for the first time at your defensive perimeter. And meeting a force that wants you dead, where they've already realized your position and now are maneuvering on you with the mental state of it's time to go to war, Balake. Well, you are on your you know third time this week sitting at that checkpoint with the mental state of, man, why is my bok choy failing to take on my newly constructed hydroponics plant is worlds apart versus being in that position knowing a threat is coming. This notion that there are acceptable casualties is technically true, but very misleading in a survival context. We are not the military with a large aid station backing up and huge amounts of reserves. We have none of that, especially for the smaller teams where the loss of even one or two people is catastrophic. By attempting to work towards a larger intelligence picture, we can do a lot to just mitigate these threats, avoid them, be aware of developments, and obviously, worst case, we have to fight an accidental threat, we can do so on our terms. Nova Ruck, 2022. Now, I'm not going to get too much into gear, strategy, and plans here today. Frankly, it's something I'm working on with my team, myself personally, but it's something I'm slowly working towards. I think this is a critical component of preparedness in a deep shit hit the fan type scenario. There are a lot of YouTube channels on the internet that get into recce and you just need to adapt what they're doing, usually geared towards military style actions to your specific environment. I personally lean heavily into night vision as it allows for much safer infill exfil, even against groups that already have night vision. It's just the reality of how night vision works. Optic systems like tripods, notation, thermals, you name it, all of these are incredibly critical to actually observe an area. Yeah, you can kind of do it with 10 to 16 X on your SPR or whatever, but you'll quickly find, oh my lord, I want to die, as you sit for hours and days behind that optical system that was not designed for that task. There's a whole nother video discussing team loadout. I think it's generally fetishized to send out platoon sized elements. Even if you have a 12 man group, which is generous for most people, you're gonna wanna send out a significantly smaller portion of it. Mostly because you can't afford that choleric burn. You're gonna have a very large footprint, but also because these people are needed at home to act as both the QRF, but simply to do administrative tasks. So you're gonna generally wanna keep it smaller, small compared to the percentage of overall people. So roughly for most people, this is looking like a two to three man team. Once again, larger communities can afford to send more out, but more often than not, they're gonna send out more individual teams more so than sending out once again, that platoon size element. Retaining the finding of ability of the unit is critical over bringing heavy casualty inflicting style things like a 15 to 20 pound 308 or 65 Creedmoor semi-auto, which would cut heavily into total firepower, reserve in a defensive break from contact scenario, spoiling action or whatever. Now there are times and places for something like this, especially if you have a vehicle to aid in your infill, but generally consider the more time you are spending getting to your location, the more in the risk zone you are. Being lightweight and avoiding the fight in the first place while having the minimum to break contact if you do get in a fight is generally probably a more logical thing to do, though once again, it highly depends on your operational environment. 300 Blackout, I've mentioned previously, is certainly potentially a valid add tool in the toolkit. You have a single rifleman's position, the same amount of ammo as 5.56, but in certain scenarios, it allows you, due to your signature reduction, avoid a fight in the first place. Comms, 
Comms are incredibly important, not just for short range line of sight communication and increased fighting ability within the team, but the ability to fire, maneuver, but also phone base for help or coordinate on a developing situation. You name it. It's obviously useful to message other people. You have a cell phone and you do it every single day. There's so much to unpack in this section and that's why I'm kind of blasting through it rapid fire style. It is so entirely situational dependent on what you can afford to do, what you can afford to train for. And for different peoples, this will be a whole ass thing, right? This, this is a whole ass discipline in the military after all. Personally for me, I'm still working on improving myself to even get myself to a baseline level and I fucking suck at it. Perhaps though, the most critical aspect, if you don't have the ability to grab your semi-lightweight kind of pack and the ability to grab a homie and fuck off on a five to 10 miler hike over several thousand feet of vertical set up camp and not die of exposure afterwards, you're gonna probably realize you're missing some of the key components as this is the most critical aspect to infill and exfill out of your situation in a time expedient manner without completely getting gassed. Anyways, this was very much a kind of free ball scenario discussion, once again, to get your, you know, your mind thinking about the idea of civilian reconnaissance. Thanks for just being here on the channel week after week, time after time. Uh, the fact that most of you realized and noticed when I shifted to three videos per month from four videos per month, so I skip a Friday, uh, because you've made me part of your Friday lunch break was very, I don't know, humbling, endearing. I, I don't know. It, it, it was kind of, it was kind of cool. And I appreciate you guys coming here week after week. Anyway, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see you guys in the next one. Thanks for watching.